and we are live. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Taylor Tuesday. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Brooke Bisbee, and I am a podiatrist practicing in Northwest Arkansas. I have been a member of Taylor uh, since its inception, and we are so glad to have all of you here tonight to join us um, for huge E&M changes in 46 days. So we've got to be ready. Um, tonight, I have a fellow moderator, Dr. Andy Badia, with us this evening, and our speaker is Dr. Jeffrey Lehrman. Most of you on here probably have heard Dr. Lehrman before, but he's a podiatrist practicing in Fort Collins, Colorado, and he operates Lehrman Consulting. He provides consulting services for coding, compliance, and documentation. He's a certified professional uh, coder and the certified professional medical auditor. He serves as, as a staff liaison to the AMA CPT, also from APMA. Dr. Badia? All right. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, a little bit about uh, Taylor uh, Medical. Uh, first, uh, replays of all our Taylor Tuesday webinars can be uh, seen at the site that you see there on the site. Uh, on the slide, which is www.taylormedical.com. And uh, these uh, replays can be accessed by clicking the webinars button, which is at the upper right hand corner. Go ahead and check out uh, the vast library of Taylor Tuesday content. So as you know, we host our monthly series on um, the first Tuesday of every month. And uh, we encourage you to join us live. We some kind of a distortion. I apologize. Uh, we tried to troubleshoot that. But we're not going to share that. So please bear with us. Okay. Uh, if you aren't familiar with uh, Taylor Medical, or if this is the first time that you're joining us on a Taylor Tuesday, uh, I'd like, I'm going to take a couple minutes uh, just to explain what Taylor Medical is and how it can help your practice. Uh, Taylor Medical is a GPO or a group purchasing organization. And so what they do is they leverage the buying power of their numerous members to negotiate discounts with key vendors and the pediatric members. And that saves you money, practice money on things like products, supplies, capital equipment, and all kinds of things that you're already doing for your practice. And not only is the membership to Taylor Medical absolutely free, uh, but you also receive a 1% annual rebate on all your qualifying purchases. So go ahead and sign up for a free, no obligation cost analysis today. All you have to do is email an Excel spreadsheet with three months of your most recent ordering history. And we'll send that to admin at tailormedical.com. That's admin at tailormedical.com. And uh, you will uh, get to see how much Taylor Medical can save you. All right, with that said, we are ready to move forward. And we welcome Dr. Jeff Lee Dorman. Hi, Jeff. I'm going to see if that noise goes away when you guys both mute, because that's pretty bad. Yeah, sorry. All right. No, we I don't. Are... Well, it looks like it's gone now. Okay, cool. Thank you, Andy and Brooke. And good evening to those who have joined us live. Yeah, somebody wrote about the feedback, but I think it's gone now. We see you in the chat. We think the feedback's gone now. Welcome to those who have joined us live to uh, this edition of Taylor Tuesday. We're broadcasting this live in November of 2022, which is pertinent given the timeliness of this broadcast and uh, the fact that the date plays a role in the changes that we are talking about. There is nothing subjective about choosing our evaluation and management levels. Choosing our evaluation and management levels is an objective process with boxes that need to be checked. And when we submit a level three evaluation and management, there are certain magic words that need to be in the note. When we submit a level four, for example, there are different magic words that need to be in the note. 
There is no ambiguity to this. There is no subjectivity to this. And all too often, providers make the mistake of making this determination based on what the encounter felt like. And I hear colleagues say things like, well, that felt like a level four or that person asked a lot of questions. So I'm going to make that a level something else. That is not how this works. Again, this is an objective process where for each level, there are certain boxes that need to be checked, certain magic words that need to be in the note. Unlike some of the other services that we deal with, there is no ambiguity. There is no guessing. The rules are very clear. And the goal of this broadcast is that about 40 minutes from now, you know exactly how to choose your evaluation and management level, what those magic words are that I'm talking about, and how to choose the level based on those magic words or keywords that I am referring to. This applies both today as we broadcast this in November of 2022, and there are major changes coming that I feel comfortable saying are going to affect every single person watching this that take effect January 1, 2023. And we will detail what those changes are. There are going to be CPT codes shared during this broadcast. And anytime CPT codes are shared in a formal manner, we must provide the reference that CPT is a registered trademark of the American Medical Association with all rights reserved by the American Medical Association. The reference for CPT codes is only the current year CPT book and the reference for these changes publication from AMA is provided on this slide. Hopefully, if you're watching this, you know that starting January 1, 2021, there was a major change to the method by which we choose our office and other outpatient evaluation and management levels. If you don't know that, and given the number of people that are on this right now, they're are people watching this right now who don't know what I'm talking about and don't know about the changes that took effect January 1, 2021. And that's okay. You're going to know when we finish this. So if you're saying, man, I really should have been on board with this for the last year and a half. I know I'm behind. I heard about this, but I don't really know what they're talking about. We're going to cover that also. So you're going to get what you should be doing tomorrow at work in addition to what we need to start doing January 1, 2023. So January 1, 2021, we had these great evaluation and management changes, which applied only to our office and other outpatient ENMs. So these changes applied only to CPT 9920 codes and CPT 9921 codes. And this changed the mechanism by which we choose the level of those evaluation and management types. This was a really great change because it removed many of the barriers that made it difficult for those that specialize in one part of the body to reach higher level ENMs. This was not a podiatry only thing. Other provider types had the same challenges under the old model, hand surgeons, ENTs, Anybody that specialized in one part of the body, for the most part, the old method made it really difficult to reach CPT 99204, 99205, and 99215. And there were many situations where we were providing level five care or level four care, but we couldn't use those codes because of the old selection methodology. The big change that started January 1, 2021, removed those barriers made it easier to reach those higher levels, but only for the office and other outpatient ENMs. The really great news, and perhaps the punchline of this entire broadcast, if you haven't already heard, is starting January 1, 2023. So as we broadcast this live, that's like six weeks from now, those same changes that we've enjoyed with the office ENMs are going to also apply to our hospital inpatient ENM, consultation codes, 
nursing facility ENM and home or residence ENM. So this is great because the same way these changes remove the barriers that made it difficult to reach higher levels for the office ENMs, we're going to enjoy those same changes now in addition with our hospital inpatient ENM, consultation codes, nursing facility ENM, and home or residence ENM. It's also great because for the last two years, we've been living in this weird model where we were choosing our office ENMs one way, but then if we went and did hospital rounds in the afternoon, we had to do it the old way. This group that we're looking at here encompasses just about every ENM type that podiatrists perform. And I know not everybody watching this is maybe a podiatrist, but most of us are. This covers just about everything we do. And if I can promote APMA for a moment, that's not a coincidence. Uh, actually, Dr. Bisbee, who you saw at the beginning here, played a really big role in this, in her role with the APMA at the RUC, where APMA representatives pushed hard both at the RUC and at the CPT panel to have these same changes that we got for the office ENMs also apply to all of these other ENM types. So everything we're going to talk about for the rest of this webinar applies to our office and other outpatient ENMs today, right now. You should be doing it this way now for the office ENMs and will begin to apply to all of these other ENM types also January 1. 2023. I'm going to repeat that. Everything we're going to talk about for the rest of this webinar, as far as how to pick the level, applies to our office ENMs now, and will continue to. And then, starting January 1, 2023, this selection methodology will also apply to hospital, inpatient, consult codes, nursing facility ENM, home or residence ENM. These are the codes that we're talking about. If for some reason, you want the code numbers. I think this makes for a really bad PowerPoint slide. But if you're looking at those titles and say, wait a minute, what, what are the number codes he's talking about? There they are. Uh, hopefully, you know from attending these in the past, you do get um, you do get the slides uh, at the end. Dr. Baccia shared that at the beginning. So you will get the slides here. Um, I'm Andy and Brooke, I'm going to break protocol here for a moment because somebody asked a question which is pertinent to what we're on, so I'm going to answer it. The question was, uh, does this apply to assisted living facilities? Yes, it will, starting January 1, 2023. We're going to get to this at the very end, so maybe I should have saved it, but I wanted to answer it with a yes. Uh, the you'll, you'll notice that home or residence e &M on this slide, that's a new title. The, the codes are being combined under the umbrella of the what used to be only home ENMs. So it's home or residence. The assisted living facility is the patient's residence. So yes, this will apply to assisted living facilities starting January 1, 2023. So this big change, which removed the barriers, was that we choose our ENM level by one of two pathways either medical decision-making or total time. So there's two totally different ways that we could choose the level, either medical decision-making or total time. And the way this is supposed to work is we have the encounter, we provide the evaluation and management, we document what happened, and then we go back and look at our note. And we have to do this twice for each encounter. We ask, what would our level be if we chose it via the medical decision-making pathway, and then separately ask, what would our level be if we chose it via the total time pathway? And whichever one of those pathways results in a higher level is the one we get to choose. I find after living with this for two years that not all, but most practices end up using one pathway way more than the other. And whichever pathway you use is typically dependent on your practice type. Not always, but just my experience working with a lot of colleagues with this is that 
If you have more of a fast moving practice with good assistants who are helping through the process uh, with a pretty quick turnover rate, normally those practices are using the medical decision making pathway more. In contrast, those that maybe do a lot of second opinion, revisional surgeries, a situation where the patient shows up maybe as a, a, a third opinion with a three years worth of records that you have to read through and call another doctor that many of these, those practices are more often choosing the level based on total time. But I'll say again, either pathway is fine. And if you find yourself using one more than the other, that's totally fine. We are going to go through both of these pathways and satisfy the goal that I stated at the beginning, which was to know exactly how to choose the level by both pathways, starting with the medical decision-making pathway. So we said, do the visit, do the note, and then ask, what is my medical decision-making level? And by this new selection methodology, there are four potential answers to that question. Only four. Straightforward medical decision-making, low medical decision-making, moderate or high. And now those terms sound subjective, but they are not. You will see what I mean by the boxes that need to be checked for each and the key words that go with each of these four medical decision-making levels. So when we choose by the medical decision-making pathway, it's going to be one of these four levels. How do we determine which of those four levels we have, in order to make that determination, we consider three elements of our encounter. And those three elements that we consider are number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. Each of the four medical decision-making levels has its own thresholds of these three elements. So straightforward medical decision-making has its thresholds of number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. Low medical decision-making has higher thresholds of number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. Moderate medical decision-making has higher thresholds of number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. Each of the four levels has its own list of these three things. And if we meet two out of three, any two out of these three thresholds, then we can choose that level. This PDF from the AMA brings everything together that I just said. My intent is not for you to read this. I know you can't read this on the screen. You will be able to read it when you get the slides. So the idea is not to read all of these words. We're actually going to zoom in on every single one of these boxes for the rest of the webinar here. This is more just to get the concept of what we were talking about and put it all together on one slide. If you look down that first column all the way to your left, you'll see the four levels of medical decision making. Straightforward, low, moderate, and high, right? So we said if we're going to pick the level based on medical decision making, it's one of those four. And there they are, straightforward, low, moderate, and high. And then if we look at the three columns going from left to right, there are our three elements, number and complexity of problems, data in the middle, risk on your far right. And here, it, if it didn't make sense when I said it, because I feel like that gets a little sloppy when you state it, but here I think it brings it all together. You can see that if you look from left to right next to each medical decision-making level, straightforward has its, here's the magic word that I talked about, has its thresholds of number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. Then we go down to low medical decision-making. Now there's a different list for number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. We will zoom in on each of these. Then we go down to moderate, different thresholds for number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. This really brings it all together. I'm pretty confident that we're going to spend an hour together here, but when we're done, this is all you're going to need. 
And if you're not already using this, the suggestion is to print this out and have it next to you when you're doing your coding, pin to the cork board maybe, or open on another monitor next to you at the office. This tells us exactly what we need for each level. So this is where I said we have keywords. There is nothing subjective. This is an objective check the box situation where if we think we have moderate medical decision making, we have to satisfy two out of those three moderate boxes, right? We have to be able to check the box of two out of the three of moderate number and complexity problems, data and risk, and be sure that the documentation supports it. The slides are going to be made available. I have a QR code at the end of this too that you could just take a picture and you can have it immediately. If you want the PDF, it is free and online. AMA wants us to have it. I'm going to give you something to Google right now if you want to. It's a really simple Google search. If you want this PDF right now, you could even have it in front of you as we go through the rest of this if you want or if you want to hang it up at the office tomorrow. If you search AMA, evaluation and management table, you'll get this. I'll repeat that. I checked it before we started to make sure that search works. AMA, evaluation and management table. Like I said, it's free, it's online, and we get this PDF. And this is really everything we need to know. So now let's zoom in on each of these boxes and see what I mean by the magic words. So we start with straightforward medical decision-making, which you can see for our office e &Ms equates to a level two. And then there are our three elements that we need to consider. Number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. Dr. Bisbee just put that Google search in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Bisbee. Uh, so for those of you watching, if you want to read what I just rattled off, Dr. Bisbee typed it in for us. Thank you are three elements of number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. So it may not be surprising to see that the thresholds for the lowest one, the thresholds for straightforward, are really low. It's not hard to reach straightforward medical decision-making, right? We need two out of the three. So we can see that one of the options for number and complexity of problems is one minor problem. And then when we look at the options for data, one of the options for data is none. So if we have zero data and one minor problem, we have straightforward medical decision-making. That's easy. Now let's step it up to the next one, right? So now if you're back at that AMA grid, uh, this is the next row down. Now we're at low medical decision-making, which for office e &Ms equates to a level three. And now we look across at our three elements that we need to consider. Number and complexity of problems, data, and risk. There's more options here. It's a busier slide. There's more words on the slide. But really all it is, it's more options. It's more ways for us to get in, which is good, right? So now we look at the options for number and complexity of problems. And I want to draw your attention to the second one, which says one stable chronic illness. And this is where the magic words, the key words come into play. Most of us are really good about a good, thorough history of present illness. The suggestion, and, I, and I'll say this is not a rule that is written anywhere, but I am suggesting this based on what I've seen from auditors for the last two years or so since this started. The suggestion is to use these magic words. This is a situation where we've been given the answers to the test. If an auditor is going to come read our notes to see if the documentation supports the level that was selected, this is what they're looking at. There's nothing more. There's no secrets. There's nothing hidden. This is it. And auditing is really just checking boxes. Auditors have a list of boxes that need to be checked. And if an auditor shows up at our office and says they submitted a Level three for this one, I want to see if this note supports a level three. This is what we're looking at. So my suggestion is if we have a history of present illness that supports the presence of a stable chronic illness, we have that story, right? Patient presents with, it's been there this long, they tripped over their dog, you know, whatever the story is, we're good about that normally. We then add, here's the magic words, this is 
one stable chronic illness. And I should share, CPT defines chronic as one year. That's been a common question with this. What does chronic mean? CPT defines chronic as one year. Or look at the next one, an acute uncomplicated injury. So we have the HPI, right? Normally we're really good with, and I'm making this up. 15-year-old, plays basketball, came down on somebody else's foot. They think their foot turned in. They heard a pop. It turned black and blue. They've been limping on it, and now they're here. We're good about that. I'm suggesting, because that's a healthy, uncompromised 15-year-old, so that's an uncomplicated injury. I'm suggesting we use these magic words and add the sentence, this is one acute, uncomplicated injury. Let's jump to our moderate medical decision-making, where I suggest these magic words become even more important. Again, more words on the slide, busier slide. It's just more options. Same three elements, number and complexity of problems, data and risk, three elements. We need to reach two out of the three on this slide if we're going to choose moderate medical decision-making, which for office e equates to a level four. So let's look at this, this first option under number and complexity of problems. One or more, so it could be one, one chronic illness with progression. One chronic illness with progression. I think a lot of us see this quite a bit. Not every patient that presents with a painful bunion, but think about the typical new patient with a painful bunion or painful hallux limitus or painful Taylor bunion. Most of the time, it's been there for more than a year and it's progressing. It's getting worse. That's why they came in now, right? That, mo that's Taylor bunion, hallux limitus, hammer toe, that stuff. Normally, when we ask these questions of how long has it been there, how long has it hurt, what made you come now, not always, but oftentimes the story ends up with it's been there for many, many years. It didn't start to hurt until the last couple of years, and now I'm here because over the last three to six months, I notice I can't walk my dog as far as I could at the beginning of the year, right? Whatever that story is. That story represents a chronic illness with progression. Don't be thrown off by the word illness. I, I've seen some colleagues make the mistake of thinking that that must imply some sort of systemic condition like pneumonia or CHF or something. It's just an abnormal state. Uh, APMA was, the, we were there when these changes were made. We actually played a role in writing these changes. And having been in the room, I can share that illness was not meant to represent only a systemic condition. It's just a disease state. So yes, our, as podiatrists, our stuff counts. So this again is a situation where adding the magic words is recommended. Most of our notes are really good about that HPI, about the painful bunion, how long it's been there, what the problem is, it's getting worse, they can't exercise as much, whatever. And the suggestion is to add, this is one chronic illness with progression. We could look at any of these examples. Or let's go to the last one. One acute complicated injury. So we gave the example of the 15-year-old with a straightforward ankle sprain. What about, let's, let's, let's make it complicated now. What if the history of present illness talks about a 90-year-old who fractured something and they have poor vasculature, and they have no ability to be non-weight-bearing, and they're malnutrition because they're 90. That's now a complicated fracture. And again, the recommendation, in addition to that whole HPI, is to add, this is one acute complicated injury. Why? Why am I making that recommendation? The reason is because the auditors might not be able to draw that conclusion themselves. And I'm suggesting that we shouldn't leave it up to them to figure it out. We shouldn't leave it up to them to say, oh, I see this person's 90 and their bone quality's poor. And the note says that it can't use crutches. So this seems complicated. 
I suggest we not leave that up to them. Now, you might say, well, they should be able to do that. It's their job. I agree. It's not cool. I don't think it's fair. They should be able to do that. Many of them can't. And if we give them what they're looking for, if it's true and the documentation supports it, we're going to make their jobs much easier. And we are going to improve our chances greatly of them checking the box that should be checked. And that's why the suggestion is to add that sentence. Now, you might say, oh, my gosh, you're telling me I have to put more into my note? Yeah, I'm suggesting another sentence or two. However, this is all the stuff for a level four. This is it. And what I suggest is if you type if you're using an electronic health record that allows you to click on sentences if you type all of this stuff in your EHR once which will take 7 minutes you won't be happy for those 7 minutes and you'll be mad that you have to do it i was but then you have it forever and you can click the sentence of this is one acute complicated injury and then you have it for the rest of your career that's my suggestion. Now, if we look at the bottom here under risk, I think the data is, is pretty straightforward and easy to interpret what they're talking about here. Uh, if you want to, we could talk about that more during the Q&A. My goal was to leave like 20 minutes for Q&A here. So I'm, I'm shooting to be done at about 40 minutes past the hour. So we are. So please bring your questions. We want them. That was was part of the goal of this. If you look down at risk, you'll see moderate. Now, that's not subjective either because CPT gives us examples of moderate risk. One of those examples is prescription drug management. So if we manage a prescription medication by writing a prescription, stopping a prescription, telling a patient to continue with their prescription, that is prescription drug management. Or... There's been lots of education. APMA coding has done tons of education on this. I, I know I've done it at a lot of the state conferences talking about coding and documenting for social determinants of health. If there's a social determinant of health that significantly limits the patient's diagnosis, like access to food, access to water, access to transportation to our offices, I've just described a lot of our patients. There's another example of that magic words, right? The keywords, which are all on this grid. We're just zoomed in on level four right now, right? So patient states, they have difficulty getting transportation to the office and I can't see them as frequently as I should, right? Maybe you say diabetic foot ulcer. I really should be seeing them once a week, but because of their transportation limitations, I can only see them once a month. And then magic words, this, that is a social determinant of health, right? This social determinant of health significantly limits the patient's diagnosis. Here's our level five list, high medical decision-making. Here's a situation where I like to use Sharko as an example. Again, I'll draw your attention to the number and complexity of problems. A chronic illness that poses threat to bodily function. Yeah, right? Sharko, high amputation rate. That's normally chronic. And it normally poses a threat to bodily function. But again, the magic words, because auditors typically don't know how bad Sharko is. They might not know that it poses a threat to bodily function. And I cringe when I say this. Many of them don't even know what Sharko is. So this is why I'm suggesting we not rely on their ability to make the determination. Give them the sentence they are looking for. Here's our examples for high risk. Everything we just did is here. All of the magic words are here. So I'll say again, you have a note tomorrow morning in the office and you have this grid next to you and you think you have a level four, we need to check two out of the three level four boxes, any of the levels. I'm just picking level four as an example. With the magic words in the note. That's medical decision-making. There's questions come in, which is great. Thank you. Uh, but we'll, we'll save those for the end here so that we 
finish on time or close to the time that was promised. That's the medical decision-making pathway. The total time pathway is a little easier. Well, it's a lot easier, actually. And I'll repeat because I I'll, this the number jumped a lot since we started here. So I'm going to repeat this. Everything we're talking about here applies to office ENMs today and will begin to also apply to hospital inpatient, consultation codes, nursing facility ENM, home or residence ENM starting January 1, 2023. The total time pathway, which is a completely separate pathway, only use one, pick one. I've seen some notes that have like something about the minutes and then something about the number and complexity of problems, which can confuse an auditor. They're thinking, okay, which pathway did they, did they use here? Pick one and make sure the documentation is clear in reflecting which pathway was used. Total time is total time spent by the doctor on the day the patient was in the office. Total time spent by the doctor furnishing the ENM on the day the patient was seen. So this is not assistant time. This is not resident time. This is not time in the waiting room. It has to be doctor time and time spent performing the ENM. Anything that you do that is necessary to complete the ENM. Anything. Getting ready, looking at notes ahead of time, talking to family members, taking your history, performing the exam, creating the note. These nine bullets that were on this side and the last slide are just examples, not all inclusive, just examples of what the doctor might do during that time. And of course, if you're going to choose the level based on time, we should document the time, right? Something along the lines of, I spent, and I chose the word I for a reason, because it's doctor time and we are the ultimate author of the note, right? We're the ones signing the note. I spent a total of blank minutes performing today's evaluation and management. And then the suggestion is to list what you were doing during all of that time. We don't have to assign minutes to activities. So it does not have to be 10 minutes for this and five minutes for that. That rule doesn't exist anywhere. We should list what we were doing, right? So if it says, I spent a total of 45 minutes furnishing today's evaluation and management, what might follow that is something along the lines of, during this time, I reviewed the notes from the referring provider, read through their history, looked at the x-rays that were on the PAX system, Performed the history, performed the exam, answered their sister's questions, wrote a prescription, and whatever, right? Whatever we did that day to furnish the ENM. If it didn't make sense when I said it in the beginning, having gone through both pathways, maybe it makes more sense now that most practices use one way more than the other based on how the practice functions, pathology mix right? And the, the type of pathologies that you're taking care of in your office. Here are the time values for the office and other outpatient e &Ms for new patients. And when choosing the level based on total time for established office and other outpatient, here are our time values. I'll say again, this has everything we need. Suggest this how you have this next to you at all times when coding and documenting and get the magic words in the note. Now, looking at this for the office ENMs, what we're living with today, pretty easy, right? Straightforward goes with twos, low goes with threes, moderate goes with fours, high goes with fives. That's easy. But starting January 1, we start to apply this to all of these other ENM types, which is really great, but we're probably going to need to have this with us too. So nothing changes with everything we just talked about. It's the same AMA grid, right? It's still straightforward, low, moderate, or high. But with some of these, it doesn't tie as cleanly to the code level. For example, initial hospital, there's only three options. So unlike new office, we don't have four, we have three. So now we have a situation where Two of those medical decision-making levels point to the same code. 
So I think we're going to need to have these next to us also starting January 1, unless you memorize this, which we're probably not because there's a bunch of these. And then the time values change also, right? So we have to be careful to not necessarily equate it to a level by number, but rather to the code. So these are how we will determine initial hospital inpatient. Here's subsequent hospital inpatient. I don't think it makes for a good webinar to read these. You get the idea. You just need to have the slides, right? I'll say again, use the AMA grid and the magic words to first determine the medical decision-making or the time. And then once you have that, you can determine the code level. Here are our office consult codes, inpatient consult codes. These are the same codes. We know these code numbers. It's just the method by which we determine the level is changing and changing for the better. Initial nursing facility, subsequent nursing facility. Here's the question was asked in the beginning about home or residence. Here's new patient home or residence and established patient home or residence. Uh, these I was only going to do if there's time and I'd rather get to Q and A. And if there's more time, we'll come back to those. The slides are available like Dr. Bacha shared uh, through Taylor. But if you prefer this way, some people like this better. You can do this too. any smartphone. I tested it before we did it. It should work. Any smartphone, if you hold that up to your screen with the camera on, you should get the slides. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you are a Taylor member, thank you for being a Taylor member. If you're not, uh, please take the advice that Dr. Bacha shared in the beginning because you can really, really, really help yourself and your practice by purchasing through Taylor. And we welcome Dr. Bisbee back to moderate and help with our Q&A session. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Lerman. That was great information. Um, a couple of people have asked, so where in the note do we put the magic phrases or the magic words? It doesn't matter what section it's in. Well, you guys help too, because you you know this as well as I do. I'll I'll go first. Uh, I, so the, the first thing is, there's no rule that says it has to go anywhere. Like we learn in school, S O A P, and that's very nice, and that might help to make a good structured note, and other doctors can find what they're looking for. But for auditing purposes and for coding purposes, there's no rule written anywhere that says where this stuff needs to go. It just needs to be there. I'll suggest and just share what I'm doing. I put the number and complexity of problems magic sentence in the subjective because it normally goes with the story. And I put the risk magic words in the plan. That doesn't mean it's right. Brooke and Andy, you're doing this too. What? How are you handling that? That's exactly what I'm doing. I, I list um, same order as you in, basically in the subjective and then in the plan at the end. Okay. Yep, so, um, so we have a, uh, a medication ma medication management question. So the example that was given was if you have a, a patient that you're talking to for fungal nail management and you want to put them on oral meds, so you're going over all of the um, potential risks and, and things, and you go ahead and write the prescription, so you do a 99214, when they come back for a refill, since it's the same medication, can you do a 99214 again? So the, the question is, you pres me prescribe a medication and you use that. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get back. The slides move slowly. I'm getting back to uh, we went through the moderate medical decision making risk examples. And one of them was prescription drug management. So we said, if you manage a prescription, that will get us. I should not have started this. This is taking too long. Let's stop here. <laughs> well, no, no, I'm almost there. That'll get us. That'll get us that moderate risk, right? Here it is. Moderate risk, prescription drug management. So we give the patient a prescription. Now they come back. And the way the question was written is they come back and get a refill. So this depends on what was actually done and what was documented, right? If it's just like they call and say, I need a refill, no. 
However, if they come in, we we're talking about evaluation and management here. So we have to satisfy the requirements of an evaluation and management. So if instead it's chief complaint of whatever, the example given here was fungal toenails, right? So chief complaint, thick, discolored toenails, history of present illness, they took the medication for X months. They think it's better or not better, whatever. They tolerated it, whatever happened, right? Then an exam of those fungal toenails, what we see. And then we need the M, right? We need the management. So something along the lines of, and I'm making this up, but I hope you get the idea. We discussed uh, we discussed the progress that they've made on this medication. We have the option to either discontinue it or go another round. We discussed the potential advantages and disadvantages of both of these pathways. I explained what would be involved in stopping versus continuing. Patient asked if they continued. Will they have to whatever? And after this discussion, the decision was made to manage this prescription by refilling it. That's a yes. And I was so careful in answering that because the note needs to support it. And I've seen colleagues have a note where it's like patient, and this is going to sound silly, but these notes exist. I hope you're rolling your eyes when you hear this. Patient presents for follow-up of fungal toenails, refill, product, whatever. And that's the whole note. And then they submit a level four and say, well, I manage the prescription. That's the difference. And that's why I was so careful in answering that. So the answer is yes, if the documentation supports it. Okay. Two other questions about medication management. And um, one is if you um, talk, go through all of that and talk about the risks and, and everything and recommend that the patient declines taking the prescription, can you bill a level four? And then the second one along medication management is, does it have to be oral medication or can it be a topical that's dispensed from the office? Okay. So first one is if you, if you discuss a prescription medication and ultimately don't do it or patient declines or decides they don't want it. Yes, that absolutely counts. That is managing a prescription, any management of a prescription, deciding to do it, deciding to not do it, deciding to stop it, deciding to start it. Yes, that counts. The second question, and Dr. Bisbee and I have been on APMA calls about this in the last week. The second question was, and all three of us actually were at a meeting this weekend talking about this. Uh, the second question was, if it's a topical dispensed in the office, does that count? No. Look at what's on the screen here. Prescription. Prescription drug management has to be a prescription. So if it's dispensed in the office, that is not a prescription. That does not count. Okay, let's see here. Let's move on to another subject. Uh, can you clarify the difference for hospital initial versus consultation E&M codes? Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, so this is good because pretty high error rate with use of consultation codes. The question was, can you differentiate between an initial hospital encounter versus uh, initial hospital consultation? It's important to define a consult for purposes of coding. This is a very common error among specialists. This is right out of the CPT book. This is Nobody's opinion or what anybody thinks, it's in the book. In order to choose a consultation code, in order for it to be considered a consult for CPT code purposes, there's a couple things that need to be in place. The patient needs to have been sent by another provider. And then, here's the key, in order for it to be a consult, we have to evaluate the problem make a recommendation, and then, here's the part a lot of us get wrong, send them back. Has to be sent from another provider. We render our opinion or advice and then send the patient back. There are way too many specialists. This is not only a podiatry thing, but we make this mistake a lot too. It's not just that they were sent from another doctor. 
if you completely take over the care of that problem, it cannot be a consult. And most of the time, that's what we do, right? If the patient, if the PCP has a patient with heel pain and they refer them to us, we don't make a recommendation and then send them back. The doctor doesn't want that patient back, right? We typically take over the care of that heel pain. That makes it not a consult. So the same is true in the hospital. If we completely take over the care of the pathology that we were asked to evaluate, it is not a consult. If we come in, evaluate, make a recommendation, provide some advice, and then leave, then it is a consult. So it's an important differentiation that applies both inpatient and outpatient. All right. So question here is, uh, and, and and forgive me if, uh, if I'm kind of losing track. There's a whole bunch of questions coming in. Uh, it says, so a topic, topical clotrimazole prescription, even though low risk for any side effects can qualify for 99214? Yes, that counts as prescription drug management. And again, I'm being picky with your words because I'm a compliance guy. That alone doesn't get us a 99214, right? So let's look at 99214 on the grid here. Moderate medical decision-making, three things we need to consider, number, complexity, problems, data, and risk. We need two. We got to have two. So yes, the clotrimazole, even though it's low risk and a mild thing, counts as prescription drug management that only gets us one of the two. We still need another one. I just, I don't want anybody to, and you're probably rolling your eyes and saying, I know that's not what I meant. Just want to be really careful. I don't want anybody to come away with this incorrectly saying, if I write a prescription, I get a level four because that's not the messaging. If we write, a, if we manage a prescription, we're halfway to a level four because we got the risk, but we still need one of the other two in addition. Uh, please discuss undiagnosed problem with uncertain prognosis. Awesome. Thank you for asking. That has been a common error. When we look at, probably not written that well, I will concede. Uh, when we look at the moderate medical decision-making number and complexity problems, one of the options is undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis. This is meant to represent a situation where we get done seeing the patient and we don't know what it is and we're not sure where it's going. So the encounter's done and we have not yet made a diagnosis and we're not sure where it's going. I think a really good example for us as lower extremity specialists is a red hot swollen first MPJ. Where we get done and we're saying it could be gout or it could be septic arthritis, but the patient's going to have a joint aspiration tomorrow morning, or we're going to order whatever, or some sort of imaging, right? That encounter could totally end. This could happen where our note says differential diagnosis is gout or septic first MPJ. I'm not really sure. It could be either. And we're going to do X to figure it out. That's undiagnosed and two very different prognoses with those problems, right? That could go in two very different directions. That's what that is meant to represent. I've, and it's fair the way it's written. I've seen some colleagues make the mistake of saying, isn't every new problem undiagnosed? I get it. That is not what that's meant to represent. Undiagnosed new problem is we don't know what it is at the conclusion of the encounter. Like another going on, just another good one is Charco or osteomyelitis. We might not know until they get their imaging study tomorrow. Great. I'm just going to run through a couple. Let me know if you've already uh, answered these. So I can code a level four, even if I spend only 10 minutes with the patient. That's correct. Yeah. So the somebody astutely wrote in, is it possible to get to moderate medical decision-making even if it only takes me 10 minutes to get there? Yes, because we can choose by either pathway. Either pathway is fine. There's no overlap in the two pathways. You got to pick one for that encounter and stick with it. And if when looking at this, you check 
two out of three of the level four boxes, yes, you have a level four regardless of how much time it took to get there. And this, again, is why it's important. Don't mix up the two. I've seen some notes that have magic words from this, but then also talk about how many minutes they spent, which is going to confuse the auditor. So pick one pathway and be sure the documentation is clear in outlining which pathway was used. Great, thanks. If a patient's diabetes is recently elevated, treated by the endocrinologist, would that be considered uh, considered as chronic illness with exacerbation? So the question was, diabetes where the glucose was recently elevated and it had to be evaluated by the endocrinologist, would that be considered chronic illness with exacerbation? Yes, for the endocrinologist. We're not managing that, right? It might play a role in our decision making, but all the stuff we're looking at in these boxes has to pertain to the chief complaint for which the evaluation and management was performed. The patient didn't come to us to fix their recently elevated glucose. So for our purposes, no, that would not play a role in our medical decision-making determination might not feel totally fair because that makes the patient more complicated, but that likely will come into play somewhere else, right? That might make their injury complicated, or that might uh, uh, increase the risk associated with their charco or something like that. But that's not for us. That's for the doctor who evaluated that pathology in this example being the diabetes. Great. And tons of questions coming in. We won't be able to get to all of them, so we're going to do the last one here. A uh, new patient comes in with plantar fasciitis. If you take an x-ray and give an injection, um, advise patient to take Motrin, stretching, etc. cetera. Uh, there's no tests to review or orders, so it's low risk, uh, no histor historian needed, um, or speaking to another physician. Would that be a 99202 or 203? Well, I didn't follow everything you said, but... Okay. A new patient uh, comes in with plantar fasciitis. You take an X-ray and give an injection, uh, and then you advise Motrin stretching. Uh, there's no tests or orders, uh, so it's low risk, uh, no historian needed, or speaking to another physician. So is that a 99202 or 203? Okay, so the person who typed that in didn't tell us how long it had been there. Uh, so that's going to play a big role because we have to know whether it's chronic or not. But let's let's assume it's not, right? Fasciitis people normally don't say it's been there for a year. So the person who wrote this said no tests. So data is already out, right? We have zero data. The x-ray, if you perform the x-ray, you're submitting the code for the x-ray. We don't get to double dip on that. So we have zero data, right, for level four, zero data. Now we go and look at the number and complexity of problem options do these fit anything with that story? No, they don't, assuming it's not chronic, which it's probably not. So now let's go back to level three. This is, let's say it, it, we don't have the whole past medical history on this patient, but it's probably uncomplicated. So if it just started, that's acute. So we have acute and uncomplicated, and there's certainly low risk associated with plantar fasciitis. So based on one acute, uncomplicated illness and low risk. That's a CPT 99203, what was described in that question. Perfect. Thank you so much. And with that, at 9 p.m. Eastern, we're going to conclude our webinar. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was excellent. Uh, even though I've heard you do this before, I'm always picking up new things. So it was it was uh, it was very informational, and I hope uh, all the attendees felt the same way. Thank you again uh, for attending. Uh, we appreciate your support. Please join us again next Taylor Tuesday, which is December sixth at five p.m. Pacific, eight p.m. Eastern. Thank you to Dr. Brooke Bisbee for joining us, and we look forward to seeing all of you next time. And again, if you see the slide, December 6th, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Take care, everybody, and good night. Bye, Jeff. Bye, bro.